Good afternoon, everybody. This is Marilyn Francis from the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. The webinar is Small Practice Strategies for Incorporating the Patient and Family Voice into Practice Transformation. And just some um, housekeeping. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that you can uh, click the handouts pane uh, to uh, download the slides uh, and any resource materials. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions by typing it in the box uh, that says questions. And we will be doing a, a, a question and answer period at the end of this session. Um, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and, and participate in the uh, conversation and you will be unmuted. And then you can also adjust the size of the speaker panel and the, um, the slideshow. Uh, after the webinar, please complete the uh, post-webinar survey that we'll be sending you. Your feedback is definitely, we really like having the feedback so we can always keep improving our uh, webinars. And we will be sending you a recording and posting the slides um, and materials on the PCTCC website at pctcc.org slash webinars. Now, just to tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, we have a mission for promoting collaborative approaches to primary care improvement. Our main areas of focus are patient-centered care, patient-family engagement, patient activation, and improved cost quality and experience outcomes. We're also a support and alignment network within the uh, CMS Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. And as you can see on the right of your screen, we do have many resources that can be useful to practices for quality improvement and also for uh, establishing and moving forward with patient family engagement. So with that, I will turn it over to Mary Minetti, our speaker for today. Thank you, Marilyn, and welcome everyone. I really appreciate you joining us live for the webinar. I hope that you'll find um, practical strategies that you can uh, put into place in your practices. I, um, I work with the Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care and as the policy and program specialist, I've worked with over 100 practices across the United States and Canada who have been working to change and improve the care that they deliver um, and, and want to do that in partnership with patients and families who they serve through their practice. We have some pretty simple objectives in that we really want to um, highlight the value of engaging patients and families and help you come up with some methods that will be sustainable. I think that that really is the issue in small practices, and even in large practices, is um, how do we take a pilot or a small trial and turn it into something that becomes the way we do our work? So what I'd like to do now is just get a sense of who is in the room in terms of the size of the practices that you have. And so Lauren, our tech support, is going to ask you to very quickly select the size of your practice, and then we'll be able to see, um, it's interesting, uh, different articles uh, de describe small practices um, in different amounts of providers. and so. It will help me to focus my comments if I know who's on the line for today. So we'll give you just a couple more minutes. I was reading an article um, from Health Affairs last August that really said that um, small practices have better outcomes than large practices. In fact, a 33% uh, smaller admission rate for um, conditions that are best served in primary care. I thought that was interesting. And that um, because of the autonomy and independence of small practices, uh, burnout is less of an issue for providers in small practices. So Lauren, if you can close the poll, then we'll be able to see who we've got. So it looks like we've got 38% um, of our practices are small, very small, one to three providers. Okay, and um, so Lauren, I'm unable to see the slides anymore. Oh, there they are. Okay, so I want to just provide you with a little bit of 
context uh, related to uh, why patient and family engagement is really uh, important. And in 2013, which it's hard to believe was six years ago, Health Affairs actually committed an entire article to patient engagement and called it, the editor called it the blockbuster drug for um, really transforming practices. And there were a variety of, of articles about that. But um, up until that time, there was not a, a consensus definition of what patient engagement was. So, Lauren, my slides aren't moving and I'm not sure what's going on. Sorry for the technological delay, but um, <clears throat> thanks. So the, um, so it was defined in the health affairs article and has been um, described as partnership between patients and families. Up until that uh, period of time, the, um, it really became a priority um, at four levels. And today's workshop really is around at the practice level um, related specifically to quality improvement and healthcare redesign. There is a continuum of patient engagement, um, even in the transformational level as it relates to, um, to quality improvement. Lauren, I think you're gonna end up having to do the slides because they're not moving for me for some reason. I apologize, folks. You just try clicking in the box where they are? Yep, I'm in the box and I clicked. Nothing's happening. Right, one last thing, just sorry everyone, one moment. Give that another shot. Okay, okay. It just went back and forth among a couple slides. So, yeah, there's some kind of delay happening on my end. So if you can move to the slide that um, has the continuum of patient engagement, that would be great. So one of the things that I think is really important as we think about engagement as it relates to organizational design and governance um, is to think about what the North Star is. That in patient engagement at its very um, best forms, it's a partnership and shared leadership between the patients and families who advise us in our practice and they help co-lead the change. Now, most of us, um, most practices that I work with are between the surveying where they're consulting with their patients and they're getting one directional feedback like using the CG caps, which is a good start. Um, they're surveying their patients about what, how things are working. Um, involvement is the next level of engagement and that's where uh, advisors might provide some input but aren't really sitting at the table as we're coming up with solutions. We might be as, a, as clinics uh, having brainstorm solutions and then actually uh, asking them what they think about those solutions. Next slide, Lauren. So what we know about um, patient and family engagement, and there's, there was an entire white paper from the National Academy of Medicine that basically said the evidence around patient engagement is really important because it really shows improvement in culture, care, health care, and, and people's health and the cost. That is that the things that we're working on, which is the reason that we're working to change and improve care, um, reduced readmissions, shorter lengths of stay, um, having people be able to be successful in self-managing their chronic conditions is really improved when we create systems of care and ways for patients and families to provide us with feedback about ways we can improve our care. Next slide, Lauren. And that many leaders in this article that was written um, really say that the thing that was really the accelerator to the improvement efforts that they were making, and don't get me wrong, improvement requires real work, it requires attention, leadership attention, um, and it requires some level of resources. Um, but leaders say that even with all of those conditions being met, having patients and families actually at the table as we're improving and providing insight and perspective and ideas really accelerate um, improvement. And that's really what we want, isn't it? We wanna make the improvement quick, we wanna sustain it, and we want it to make a difference in the patient and family experience of care, as well as providing a better um, environment to work in. Next slide. 
Lauren. So what we know is that even in a small practice, patients interact with different members of the care team from the front office person to the, um, to the medical assistant, to the provider, um, and then maybe uh, out through the, the front area again. And they experience care across that continuum as well as experience in across organizations. So they really have an idea of knowing how systems work. Um, I might know as the provider exactly what happens in the exam room when I'm in the exam room interacting with the patient and family, but I don't necessarily always know um, in great deal, detail what happened um, in each of those other touch points in our organization. And oftentimes patients and families can let us know what's working really well and they can provide some perspectives on opportunities to improve that care. Next slide, please. So we like to um, encourage practices, large or small, to be really clear about what the role of patient and family advisors, which is the common term, um, is. And what they are is they're really practice partners. When you identify patients and families that you serve who are able to um, see both sides of the issue, have some experience in interacting with your practice, who um, are looking to improve things for everyone, who have ideas and suggestions, but also are willing to roll up their sleeves. We call those practice partners, and, and they are people who uh, want to share their insights and make things better for others. We're going to um, talk about all the different ways that practices can engage patients and families as practice partners. But we're going to um, open up one more poll because I'm interested in knowing um, we're a small group and so I'm hoping we'll be able to, to converse during the, the, uh, the question and answer period. But what are the ways that you're currently integrating patients and family efforts um, to improve your practice? And here are some of the common ways that individual practices, both large and small, involve patients and families and get their perspective. And you are, um, you can select as many of the things that you are already doing, but it'll be interesting to see, given the size that 38% uh, of our practices are very small, to see what, what kinds of ways that people are engaging their, their patients and families. We'll give you just another couple of seconds to do that. There may be some things up here that you haven't um, done yet, but you've been thinking about doing, but just check those that you've actually got in place and are sustaining. Can we close the poll, Lauren? Let's see what kind of response we have. Okay, so we've got the majority of you are um, doing written surveys and soliciting comments through survey boxes or complaints. One of the things that I would say about um, the whole complaint process is there are people that, um, and you will know who those individuals are, who when they bring a complaint or a concern or an issue to you, that they present it in respectful ways. They're looking for um, solutions that are gonna work for them, but maybe also others. And they may have some ideas and suggestions about things that would help. Those people are real gems, they're kind of pearls. And so even though you might resolve their particular complaint, they also are people that would make great practice partners. And, um, and so I see a number of you are doing um, written surveys and a much smaller number are doing focus groups and, or um, a much smaller group are doing patient and family advisory councils. So we're gonna talk about all of these things and talk about some tactics and, and strategies within each of these um, that can, can be useful for people to be aware of. Lauren, if we can go back to the slides, that would be great. So this is a useful framework for participation in terms of as we look. And one of the things that I think um, is very interesting is a great percentage of you are really at what I would call engagement light. And it's a good place to start when you're getting ad hoc in, um, input from folks. 
you're either surveying them on a regular basis or, or maybe randomly, um, and you are then um, taking that information and, and uh, trying to make sense of it in the context of what they've written or how they've answered the questions and then respond to it. Um, as, you, as you move down this table, um, structured consultation is what patient councils, patient and family councils often do. They may provide input to quality improvement that you're working on, but they're not working on it. They're just hearing about it. Or they are um, uh, reviewing information, or they may even be reviewing your survey data and providing some perspectives for you. Um, but as you move down, um, when you start inviting people to be part of your quality improvement groups, if you're improving diabetes care, you've invited two or three patients who have diabetes, maybe one who's newly diagnosed and a couple that have been working in your practice for a while to help you understand what that experience is like and what would have been helpful to them. And they can often share ideas from their lived experience that are really important. As you move down that, um, that uh, grid, what you're, doing is you're providing more opportunities to bring more people in to share their perspectives and and be able to act on those perspectives. In um, an organization that actually begins to think about uh, peer support and creating a peer support program, even a small practice can have one or two patients with diabetes who can um, be peers and mentors, not to provide medical advice, but to talk about what the journey was like for them. But that obviously is more depth of engagement of patients and families in, in being involved in your practice. So as you think about where you're at, um, we're gonna talk through some of these other more in-depth ways of engagement um, so that you can begin to think about how can I expand what I'm already doing and build on it so that it's not just one directional, bi-directional, uh, information becomes the way that you do your work. Next slide, Lauren. So patient surveys really are to understand the perspective of a large group of patients. Um, many uh, ways to do written surveys, or to do surveys. There's written surveys like the CG CAPS. Um, I know of one practice, one small practice that actually um, had a text survey that went out to patients. They collected people's cell phones and they got a text within 24 hours of having had an appointment where they could answer a simple question. Um, did meeting, uh, could, did getting a visit with the doctor really help you in managing your health? And then if the patient answered no, then there was a follow-up call for that. Um, but that survey initiated the engagement with the patient beyond the office visit. And then the other way to survey people is one-on-one -on -one interviews. And I'll give you some examples of how organizations have done that, including with practice partners. Um, the advantage of a survey is you identify often in the survey, you're, you're identifying the questions or the information that you want to have. So you have some idea of what you're trying to, whether it's the communication is clear whether the wait time was the right amount. Um, but often the disadvantage of surveys is it may not provide you enough detailed information to know what changes might result in improvement. And that's the difficulty with a survey that doesn't have ongoing interaction with somebody. Next slide, Lauren. So please continue to use surveys, but think about how you can follow up with a survey. A focus group is one way that you can do that. And so some organizations, um, even small organizations, uh, may have uh, an opportunity to invite patients and families to come after hours or during a lunch um, and ask them some questions related to, let's say, a survey so that you can probe a little deeper as to what they meant when they indicated that you know, what would be clear communication? What really helps when you're communicating as opposed to just knowing it was a yes or a no or it didn't meet their needs? Um, you often are doing a focus group with a similar group of individuals. So you might wanna know about, as an example, diabetes care. And so you would invite those that um, have that particular chronic condition. It's important to create a comfortable um, environment. And in a small practice, it might be that you, um, you have kind of a, 
uh, a lunch and learn uh, focus group with your patients. The, uh, the moderator, who can be a staff person as long as they have good facilitation skills, so if you have a care coordinator or an experienced medical assistant or the practice manager, they have prepared questions and they moderate the discussion. Um, and so, so this is how a focus group works. And um, some organizations think, well, well, I have to hire a marketing professional in order to do a focus group. A focus group really is a conversation with individuals about a particular topic and then the ability to ask more questions to understand their responses so that you can make sense of that information and act on it. So one organization uh, put together a focus group of patients that, um, and it was a small practice. They, they wanted to know um, about how um, the patients would like to be notified if, because of the size of the practice, um, if there was a long wait time. And so they'd had some complaints about waiting. And so they brought together a group of people to really begin to understand um, what was important information to share with patients around wait times and what kinds of changes they might make to the way that they uh, schedule and or uh, communicate about delays in care. Next slide, Lauren. There are other kinds of ad hoc input that you can do. Um, so you can consider asking open-ended questions about a particular topic to find out what's most important. So um, for instance, if you are um, trying in your small practice to manage uh, school physicals, we're coming up to August time and, and kids are going back to school and they need to have a, a doctor's uh, approval to participate in a school sport. Um, it may be that you are thinking about, maybe last year that didn't go so well in your practice, so you're thinking about changing that. Um, asking individuals, um, parents, uh, about letting them know that you're thinking about making some changes to the way you did it and finding out from them what ideas they have or what would be most useful to them or what's important for you to consider as you make the changes. Obviously, any changes you make have to meet your needs as well, but um, that's one way to do it. The other thing, um, and I had a doctor who did this in a very small practice. She was thinking about changing her intake form, and at that time it was on paper. Um, and she was trialing it on paper, and then they were gonna put it into the EMR. Um, but she wanted to get feedback real time from patients. So as she was working, um, as she was seeing patients over a, a two week period, when it was appropriate, the patient wasn't so ill as to be able to, to respond uh, affirmatively, she would show them the form and let them know that she was interested in making a change to the form and she asked them to review it and make any suggestions to the front office staff about any questions that they had about the form, any confusions, uh, how they might improve it if, if they'd ask all the, the right questions. So that's an example of just in the moment um, being able to get ad hoc input. Next slide. So there were just a few people who indicated, 14% uh, percent who indicated that they had a um, advisory council. So let's uh, define what an advisory council is. It's a systematic way to work with the same patients over time who represent the population you serve and have them be able to provide input in an ongoing basis to your practice. And a lot of times when you do, when you read about uh, ad advisory councils, they often say the, the great number is 12 to 20. But if you're a very small practice, recruiting and managing 12 to 20 patients in an advisory council can be kind of overwhelming. So I wanted to share with you that there are a number of small practices that begin by recruiting three, two to three patients who meet on a regular basis with the leadership of the clinic. Generally, the, the, a key physician and the practice manager, and they provide input on strategic priorities and identify gaps and suggest areas for improvement. Now, one of the things you might say is, well, that's not necessarily representing the whole population, but think about your patient your patients and your families is people who have networks in the community. And they can, if you're getting input about a particular topic, um, 
they can turn to their, their larger network in the community and ask open-ended questions and bring in the input of others as well, um, or uh, help identify some gaps or areas for improvement. So um, obviously with the smaller the group, the harder it is to create that diversity, but you can be um, very strategic in making sure that the individuals that you select who you serve and provide care to um, are members in the community that do have lots of contacts. And then um, the important thing with an advisory council is to meet often enough that you build relationships and trust and they, they can provide ongoing input. Now I know in the CPC Plus program, they've said that as long as you meet with a group of patients once a year, and they call that an advisory council, that it, um, that it meets the requirement. And I'm not disagreeing with that. It does meet the requirement. It is hard, however, for an advisory council to be meaningful if it only meets once a year because you're working on your improvement on an ongoing basis. Sometimes people say, well, it's difficult to get the group together in person. And so I encourage people, there are a number of advisory councils that may meet once or twice during the year in person. And then at other times they do conference calls. Um, or they have a virtual email group of advisors that the practice reaches out to on a regular basis to solicit ideas and input on things that you're working on. Next slide, Lauren. So be thinking about that as a strategy. The other thing that you can do um, with your advisory council is to um, think about having them after hours walk through the different touch points of your clinics and talk with them about um, what the experience is like, what are the questions that they have, what are the things that create concern, um, and they can provide you with some very helpful information. An example of that is I saw a walkthrough of some advisors. There were only about four advisors on this advisory council in this small practice, but they were doing a walkthrough and they stopped at the reception area and they identified what was working well there and what were areas of concern. And then as they were walk, being led back to, and basically they were walking the process, um, they um, went by an alcove where the practice had the weight, the weight area. So that's where you got weighed and you got measured and things like that. And it was out kind of in a public area. And one of the advisors said, I'm, and it was a cultural thing, and they serve multicultural, multicultural um, patients from diverse ethnic backgrounds. And one patient indicated that she was really uncomfortable undressing her baby and having the baby in full view of people that were passing by. The practice couldn't afford to buy, um, to buy scales for every room. And yet um, another patient that was, participating in this walkthrough, noticed that this was kind of a little alcove. It was a little cut out. And he suggested that the practice just buy one of those shower curtains that has the bow in it. And they, they could put a curtain up and provide a choice for the patients because another patient said, this isn't important to me and I'm not bothered by this. Um, so we have to recognize that different patients would make different choices. But um, they created that shower curtain. They used a nice... Um, it wasn't actually a shower curtain, plastic shower curtain, but they used a, a curtain so that they could offer that for patients who would prefer as other, another patient was being pulled back to, to not um, have people observe them getting weighed or their children being weighed. And so that's an example of as you go through each of the steps of the process, um, you can identify what are things that would have never even occurred to the practice. Next slide, please, Lauren. So many of you have patient portals and often your advisors can help you understand um, how, whether or not the portal is meeting their needs. And this is an example of an organization that um, had a portal and um, the patient said, I have trouble getting to my medication list. And they found when they actually did an analysis of it, it was five clicks to get to the medication list. But the practice was really communicating to the patients how important having access to their medication list was, and some of their patients couldn't even get to it. So based on a suggestion that a patient made, 
they actually, after um, meeting with the, these advisors, put a link on the very front page of their portal and it didn't cost them any money. They just talked to the vendor and it was a simple fix um, where they could click on a link right on the front page of the portal, which often is able to be branded by the organization and um, so that people could get to the portal. And they found that more patients were contacting them and letting them know that there were some changes to their medication list based on what they were taking versus what was on the portal. So that was a safety issue. So that was another example of uh, kind of ad hoc feedback. Next slide. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, patients on the QI team. So often in a small practice, you might have a medical assistant and a doc who have identified something that they wanna work on and they're working on that. And then they're gonna pilot it with their patients and share it maybe with the one or two other clinicians that are in the practice to try to improve something. That's an opportunity informally to invite a patient or two to join them. Clinicians and staff can recommend patients and families and they can join the team to work on improving that care. So um, clearly you wanna orient them to the goal of the project and provide some background materials, but often informal QI happens in small practices all the time. And it's a matter of inviting patients to participate. And again, I want people to begin to think about the practicality in a small practice where you have really strong relationships of involving patients in virtual ways um, to participate in teams. And um, many organizations have found that very effective. The keys to that, if you're gonna do virtual participation really is being clear on when you're gonna be communicating on a regular basis to get input and how much time people have to respond and give input. Um, and conference calls also are another way to do that. Next slide, please. This is an example of a um, tool that was created for patients who have heart failure. And the things, I know this is a little busy, but one of the things this practice did, which I really recommend any practice of any size do, is when you solicit patient and family feedback, be sure and document how their input made a difference in what you were working on. So they created, the practice created this form to help patients with heart failure know when they needed to come into the doctor, when things were good. and um, the individuals with heart failure who gave feedback on this made some text edits because it was, there was parts of this form that were confusing. And the other thing that I think was probably the best thing they did is they asked the, the group to suggest and create an action column so that if, um, if you could see this form down to the red area, if something was yellow or, or red, that the patient was very clearly, there was an action the patient was supposed to do as opposed to be anxious and not know. And so um, that was something that the practice thought that patients would know what to do. And what patients really said is, you're gonna give me this form to help guide me um, to know what to do. Please be clear on that. Next slide, Lauren. So these are examples of things that other practices have done. And what I would say is that um, some of these practices were a little, larger than um, the small practices that are on this call. So these are just suggestions for you to think about how can I take this idea and in my own organization integrate it. But I really think that the key is you begin to think about patients and families being um, resources and consultants in a sense to your organization um, and partners in, in that. If you turn to the next um, slide, Lauren. What is true is that small practices have so many strengths and one of the things that you really wanna do is you wanna be able to build on your strengths. Your, one of your main strengths is you often live in communities where you know your patients and families very well. You're connected to other members of your community and because of your size, you're very creative and resourceful. So what might, um, take a long time to get implemented in a big practice when patients and families suggest cost-effective ideas can often be implemented much quicker in a small practice um, 
because of the resourcefulness and the creativeness. Um, the fact that staff fill more than one position can be a challenge, but it also can allow um, that relationship building to be stronger. And the whole issue of being able to really work as a team in small practices, that really becomes the only way that you can stay uh, operational by the provider, the doctor or the nurse practitioner, really being able to, to create a team with their medical office assistant and maybe they share a care coordinator across the, the three to five um, docs that work in the practice. But it also requires um, when you're with a small practice that you think about what is the role of a particular body in the practice because there aren't a lot of bodies. So how can we really upskill everybody? And in a sense, by in involving patients and families as advisors, um, you're upskilling them to help you with your own practice. Next slide, please. If there's one thing that you can remember, it's that you need to keep it simple. Don't create an advisory council for the purpose of creating an advisory council. Think about what are you already working on? Do your patients and families know that you're working on this? And how can you invite them to informally provide ideas, feedback, and assistance? And it can be as easy as sharing it at the front desk. It can be as easy as um, providing uh, a random uh, question to a patient on a topic that you're working on and asking them if they'd be interested in partnering with you to improve that process. Next slide. In honor of moon landing, I thought I would share with you a practice manager's uh, feedback that um, if you're clear on what you're trying to do in the first place, which is to build partnerships at the design and improvement level with patients, you take what you already know about building partnerships with patients and families, and you expand that to just as you invite patients and families with newly, new diagnoses to be an important member of their care team and to partner with you on improving their health, you're really just shifting the behaviors that you already have to asking them to partner with you on improving um, the processes in your clinic. Next slide. So what I'd say is you're already listening to your patients. And what you're now, what I'm now suggesting that you are going to be doing is you're going to be asking them different questions and just continuing the listening that you already had. So if they're filling out surveys for you and you realize that you have a concern with how medication management is being communicated or the side effects of medications are being communicated and you learn that in a survey, um, if you make time to understand what that confusion or that it problem related to medication management um, or reconciliation means, it can really help you improve your process. We're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. I have the opportunity. Um, I wasn't able to bring Mary Reeves, who is a practicing physician, to, to the live portion of this. But she did want to share her perspective as a, a, a practice physician um, about what working with patients in this way means. Lauren, if you can cue that up, that would be great. Hi, I'm Mary Reeves. I'm one of the TCPI national faculty, and I want to thank you for letting me talk to you this way today um, about uh, strategies for incorporating the patient and family voice into practice transformation efforts of small practices. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, because I think that our PFAC that we started was the single most transformative uh, effort in our practices uh, transformation efforts. Um, we are a, an old practice and we're a very traditional uh, practice uh, before uh, being enrolled in the 
comprehensive primary care initiative in 2011. There were nine milestones for practice transformation and incorporating the patient voice was one of them. We had never done any patient-centered medical homework or uh, QI work um, before uh, because uh, frankly, we were too busy uh, taking care of patients and trying to keep the lights on. And um, so this effort was new to us. I started out a PFAC skeptic, a patient family advisory council skeptic. I wasn't that interested in starting one. It seemed like it would be a lot of work to get it going and not provide much value. And um, we thought we were uh, patient centered. And so we started out with uh, surveys and it wasn't until two years into the initiative that a consultant uh, was available to us and I got out of the way. What I want you to know today is that resources for starting a PFAC are readily available. Um, it's, it, it is not, it, the steps are uh, laid out. You do not need a consultant. Um, and I want you to know that you should start one sooner rather than later. That's what I wish we had done. Um, the, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, from the time it took for us to decide to do a PFAC until their first meeting was three months, which is a very short time um, in terms of uh, practice transformation work. And, um, and so that is the first lesson I learned is that it doesn't take a lot of time. It's not a lot of work. The um, people, the way our PFAC is structured is about 12 to 16 members from the office, there um, is a physician. Um, the RN care coordinator runs the meetings um, and um, she interviewed all of the prospective um, uh, participants and, uh, and, and chose who would be on our first uh, PFAC. There's a member of the front desk staff, the back office staff, and the uh, MA staff. The members actually uh, were suggested, like I said, to the RN care coordinator and then she interviewed them. I've heard of um, people putting up a, a notice and asking for uh, volunteers. Um, and um, I'm sure there are other methods for recruiting. We found that the best recommendations actually came from our front office uh, staff uh, and back office staff. Um, so uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about that. The um, first meeting, of course, is important. Um, it's uh, during that meeting, it's, um, the exp is explained about how the PFAC is gonna um, run about patient confidentiality. Um, and begins soliciting um, suggestions from the patients for um, uh, things to for them to work on. I think the first um, uh, project that the PFAC undertakes is critical because it sets the tone for how you are going to begin partnering um, with patients and caregivers. Um, our first project was chosen um, after the um, uh, care coordinator presented our CAPS survey to the patients um, at that first meeting. Um, and because they were all saying, well, they liked our practice and they didn't see that it needed any improvement. And so she presented the CAPS survey and uh, showed them how to look at it. and they saw that access was our lowest score and they agreed that yes, access was a problem um, at our clinic, particularly the front desk phone triage system um, for uh, getting someone, a live person to answer the phone and answer the question. So here's the next revelation for me and what I want you to know. And that is, is that it, from the time 
of that first meeting until they had a solution to this front desk problem was three months. It took them three months. And the solution that they came up with is one we're still using today. Um, this, this really turned me around from being a skeptic to seeing that the, the value um, that the patients uh, provided through the PFAC. Um, they went on to redoing all of our patient forms, taking out the redundancies, making them patient friendly, um, and translating them into Spanish. They provided a walkthrough with many suggestions for improvement um, in the practice and are now moving into QI work. Just a word about the return on investment for a PFAC. Um, our PFAC, um, it, we provide, uh, we, there's a meeting place that we have. It's a bank basement in town. We provide pizza and child care. And these um, things that the patients have helped us helped us with already um, would have cost tens of thousands of dollars if we'd had a consultant work with us. The solutions are tailored for our practice. Um, they come quickly, um, much more quickly than a consultant would be able to deliver. And we're not taking some outsider's solution and trying to make it fit the practice. Um, we have seen improvements in patient care with our portal, um, networking and using the resources of the community. Um, uh, and patients involved in our PFAC have also been transformed to finding their voice and advocating for a better healthcare system. Um, one of the um, PFAC members has gone on to start a breastfeeding support group in our town. It is the single most transformative effort for our practice. It turns um, uh, the relationship of uh, into um, partnering with the practice, partnering with patients and caregivers um, for the improvement um, of healthcare delivery. It turned me into a, from a skeptic into a promoter of PFACs and all methods of formally incorporating the patient voice in healthcare at every level. You can do this. Uh, you will thank yourself. And I thank you for your attention today. Great. Well, um, let's go ahead and we're running a little late because of our technology, so let's go to the next slide, Lauren. I really want to um, show you a couple of really quick examples, and so we're going to buzz through those. One, next slide. It, it is important to see through the eyes of patients, and I think that's what kind of uh, rose. In the, that was the awareness that Mary had in her practice. Next slide. So when you walk through and you see your practice, um, you see it differently. This looks like a pretty nice pediatric uh, waiting room. Well, um, patients walk through that and parents. And uh, next slide. This is um, the changes that they made. They ask, how can we be more inviting um, and uh, welcoming? And so it didn't cost much money. It was mostly paint and some stenciling. And uh, it became a much more welcoming practice for patients and their parents. Next slide. Um, when you recruit patients, do things in unique ways. At Ferndale Family Medical Center, the main physician here, there were, I think they have four physicians at the time they did. Um, he put his, he was a computer junkie, and so he put his face in the Uncle Sam poster and they were placed at the front reception and other areas because they were redesigning their office space and they wanted to get feedback. So that was a real conversation starter um, when Dr. Ruby did that next um, slide. Uh, at St. Charles, they had a patient advisory committee say that they're, um, and this is their new space, but um, in their old space, it was difficult to navigate. And advisors volunteered to direct individuals at the entrance. And then when they did get some resources, save some resources to do a little bit of remodeling um, in their old building, 
Advisor feedback saved them 14,000 in remodeling costs because the architect wanted to do something that wasn't required and didn't really improve what the main reason they were doing the, the remodeling for, which was the navigation for patients. Next slide, please. At Western Wayne Physicians, they invited patients to sit down with them in a conference room at the lunch hour and look at the patient portal and they made changes based on that. And these, this is the team of people at Western Wayne Physicians that was um, involved in that. Um, next slide. When they were recruiting patients, this doc was so excited about this. He was really a physician champion like Mary was a skeptic. Well, he was a champion and he actually got on the phone and recruited a couple of his patients to start the effort to show people that even if they didn't want to call patients, they could at least um, nominate people to be on their advisory council. Next slide. And um, there's, an, whoops, there's an example of um, a tool that patients helped create um, for a clinic visit. Mary was talking about educational forms. Next slide. So when you make a plan, um, it doesn't always go the way you want. But um, success is like spaghetti. If plan A doesn't work, plan B, um, try plan B. And so what I would encourage you to do is don't give up the first time you try to do something with patients and families, but rather utilize some of the tools that we have on the website to um, plan how to do this best. But um, do trust the process. And I think that's what Mary did when she said that she got out of the way. Next slide. And make your steps small. If some of the ideas that you've heard today sound too big, think about, well, what's something smaller that I could do? And probably the smallest unit of action is to talk to one patient about something you're working on. Um, and often that will generate um, some success and you might get up enough time to talk with another patient and get some other ideas. But I want to go ahead and give us time to see if there are any questions. So next slide. Marilyn, do we have any questions or issues that have come up? Uh, <clears throat> we don't have any questions right now um, in the box. But uh, yes, please feel free to uh, either raise your hand or type a question in the box and we can answer them. But, um, Mary, while we uh, wait to see if uh, there are some questions, just one question I have is, has there been um, any models of um, very small practices, say like two to three physicians in an area where they actually um, came together uh, to uh, help uh, promote like this patient family engagement, like working with their all their patients together? kind of so, help build a reason. Yeah, go ahead. Are you talking about physicians from different practices coming yes, together? Yes. So yes. the answer is yes. In Pennsylvania, as part of the Aligning Forces for Quality, they um, uh, physicians identified one or two patients that they wanted to have um, be trained by to be patient advisors. And they were able to refer those physicians to a community site where they prepared and oriented the advisors and provided them with monthly meetings. And then they, then the advisors got trained and then they went back into the practices to be involved in quality improvement projects. But they got kind of ongoing support and mentoring from the community group in Pennsylvania. So it was an example of collaborating. We want to get patient voice, but we don't have the time to orient people, and we're not sure how to do it. And so they found a community group that um, said that they would do it on behalf of, and then send those advisors back into the, um, the community and back into those individual practices. Okay. And, and the community group actually did a little bit of coaching of the the clinics on examples of things that they could do with their advisors. They do that in Canada a lot. They've created whole networks of patient and family advisory recruitment community groups that provide patients to clinics. Clinics call up and, and uh, send patients for that kind of training. So they've institutionalized it more in Canada, but the one that I am familiar with is in Pennsylvania. 
Okay. If we do have a couple of questions. Okay, great. Okay. Um, from Lynn Wilson, um, how important is a pay is paying the patients or families for participating on a PSAC? Um, what patients often say is that it's important that um, I feel like I'm making a difference and that things are changing in the practice based on the feedback. That's more important than payment. However, if you have a diverse clientele and there are some populations that if you can't help them with a bus pass or child care, they're not going to be able to participate and you'll lose access to their voice, then often an honorarium can be really helpful. Um, if you're going to involve patients a lot, like in a lean event where you're going to ask them to do, you know, spend three days in your organization improving something, then it is common custom to provide an honorarium for that time because it's pretty significant. Um, and as Mary said, what their investment was was pizza and a meeting place. And so, um, Again, look at how are you going to recognize the contributions and what is the best way based on your community and your culture and that kind of stuff. And so there's a whole range. Good question, though. Was there another question, Marilyn? Yeah, there was another question just about logistics on where they can find the slides. And um, they will be posted on the uh, PCPCC website. And we will be sending them out with the um, email that has the link to the uh, to the webinar. Great. I have a couple of resource slides because I want you uh, to know about those. Lauren, can you go to the next slide? So PCPC San has worked with IPFCC and a variety of other providers to really create a, a resource library. And there are tools like a confidentiality form that you can make your own. We have uh, advancing the practice of patient and family-centered care um, in primary care, and it's very how-to with little checklists and tools that are very easy to use. And I've and I've shown you how to get there onto the website. Next slide. We also created for especially small practices. We created a how to be an effective patient and family advisor, which is a guide that you can share and talk through with patients and families that you're inviting to participate with you. And there's also a little video of me just talking about how best to use that guide. Um, but, but that, again, is when people complain about, well, I don't have time to put together a brochure or explain this information, and I'm not sure I understand all of it. Um, we built those tools as part of the PCPCC SAN so that you, to reduce as many barriers as possible to your beginning to invite patients and families. And then finally, next slide, Lauren. Finally, um, for those of you that want to see examples, uh, listen to recordings of other people that have been doing this work for a long time, we do have a free learning community called PFCC Connect, and you can sign up and you can join discussions, you can surface questions, you can look at charters that organizations, uh, job descriptions of advisors. I mean, there's a whole variety of things that this learning community of organizations in primary care and other settings have created to really enhance the partnership with patients and families related to improvement. So I want you to be aware that there are lots of resources out there. So when Mary said you don't have to hire a expensive consultant, the answer is yes, you don't have to. Um, there are tools that have been developed to make it easy for you to begin the invitation. But you ultimately have to, one, decide to do it and then take the first step. So thanks so much for your time. Do you want to kind of wrap things up, Marilyn? Okay. Yes, thank you. As I said, uh, we will be sending out a link to the uh, webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to contact me or contact Mary if you have further questions. And please fill out the, uh, the survey that will be going out um, so we can get your feedback on what you thought about the webinar. So thank you very much for spending your hour with us. And I hope that you were able to uh, find it uh, uh, a good learning experience. So thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.